this session. My name is Caroline and um, I work on behalf of the National Heritage Science Forum. Um, and uh, chairing this session this afternoon is Joseph. Hello, Joseph. Um, and um, yeah, so I thought uh, I would give you a couple of words of introduction to um, NHSF as well. Uh, this is basically the second in a series of four online events that we're running um, in um, partnership with the Icon Heritage Science Group. Um, and um, I'm sure everyone is very familiar with being online um, by now. But um, as I said, we're in meeting rather than webinar mode. So if you could keep your camera and microphone off unless you're one of the speakers, that would be great. Um, and we're recording and we'll make it available online afterwards. And that will be through the Icon Heritage um, Science Group. Um, we've had lots of uh, responses uh, to today's uh, session. So we're looking forward um, to a really great uh, couple of presentations from our speakers. Um, and um, we hope that you will really engage with those presentations and there'll be some good discussion that follows on from them. Um, and then we have um, a, as well the, the talk about the career in the field of heritage science, which I hope you will also um, find interesting and, and feel very sort of, it's meant to be a friendly environment that you can you can really you know ask, ask anything and, uh, and see what comes back. So um, NHSF itself is a grouping of organisations in the UK. Uh, we work together uh, to facilitate collaboration and knowledge exchange um, and to enhance the contribution that heritage science makes to society. Um, we work through our members of 18 organisations um, on three different strands of activity. Um, and this particular uh, sort of seminar series fits in with our, our goals around sort of strength the heritage science community of people, um, uh, sort of contributing to greater awareness of the field and, and increased opportunities to take part in it at all stages in, in people's careers. Um, and these, this idea from the seminars um, uh, was generated by a workshop that we held uh, back in March 2021, uh, where uh, it was targeted specifically at students and early career researchers who said they wanted more opportunities to share and discuss their research in a sort of uh, safe environment. So that's what we hope that this session um, will achieve. Um, so uh, I'm very, very grateful to Anne Tanas, who is also here uh, today from the Heritage Science Group, has done um, most of the hard work in putting together the programme. So thank you, Anne Tanas, on that front. Um, and with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Joseph, who is chairing this afternoon's or today's session um, and who will introduce um, our speakers to us today. Thank you, Joseph. Thanks, Caroline, for an introduction. Uh, my name is Josep Grau, Associate Professor of Heritage Science in University College London. And as Caroline said, I'm also the chair of the Heritage Science Group of ICON, the Institute of Conservation of the UK. And I, Antanas and I uh, share the chairing of this session. So it's, this, it's my turn this week. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Antanas, for organizing it and inviting me. So, as Caroline said, this was born with the intention of providing a forum for discussion. You will notice that the three topics we have here are very diverse. We are going to talk about nanoparticles in uh, used as antifungal. We're going to talk about the landscape of uh, heritage science and a project to map it. And then Ian at the end is going to tell us about his career in archaeological science. So very diverse topics. But I always like to say that if in heritage science we truly are a scientific discipline, then we must be able to talk to each other. Uh, we are united by a topic of interest and our methodologies are, are very, very diverse. But we need to be able to find a way to, to understand each other's research. Um, we are offering a, a venue for discussion so I really would like to encourage you to discuss today. Our speakers come prepared to receive questions and feedback and so on. And so we really hope that after each of the talks, there is interesting opportunity for discussion. And so that said, um, I'll introduce the first speakers, Tamar Hestring Grader and Glennis Reyerman, they are research associates in NICAS, and that's the Netherlands Institute for Conservation, Art and Science. A lot of interesting work in heritage science be being done there. And they are going to speak about their project on uh, investigating the heritage science ecosystem. Very relevant for the kinds of discussions we have here. O over to you, Tamar and Glennis.
So hello everyone, I'm going to start and then Glenis will take the second half of the, the talk today. I'm very glad to be here. Ah yes, can everyone see my uh, see the, the presentation? Is it all good? Okay, um, stop me if anything goes wrong in the middle. Um, so as was just explained, we are a project based out of the NICAS um, research conglomerate, so to speak, in the Netherlands. Uh, we are six researchers and we are looking at the heritage science ecosystem. And today we're going to focus rather than on our preliminary results, we're going to focus on the methodology, how we're going about the research. And as you can tell from the main part of the title, this has some interesting complications to it. But first, before I get into the content, I'd, I'd like to introduce who we are. Could we have the second slide, please? Thank you. So as I said, we are a group of six research associates. Um, as you can see, we come with the various expertises and specialisms uh, roughly divided by material, but um, I would like to emphasize from the start uh, that these specialisms are a tool for organizing information, not a you know, hard siloed structure that, uh, that is Put on top of things. This is a theme that's going to come back, the idea of uh, terminology and categories being useful tools, but not prescriptive. And um, I'd also like to emphasize uh, that we come from quite a wide range of professional backgrounds. So between us, we have various combinations of conservation backgrounds, curatorial backgrounds, and um, practicing art, uh, and uh, performance practice and working both in research, both within academia, within museums and outside academia and in the private sector. We also come from a fairly wide geographic background. Technically between us, we cover at least three continents and both hemispheres. However, I'd like to emphasize that when you compare our geographic and cultural backgrounds to the reality of the world, we do not come near to representing that diversity. And this is also something we're going to come back to. Now, okay, about the project. Could we have the next slide, please? So a global infrastructure for heritage science is the title that we were given. This is the title that NICAS put together for the project before they brought us on board. And, um, our task was fairly loosely defined. Uh, we were to look at how this is done, how, what are the challenges, how to improve it. Um, we came up with the subtitle, which we feel to be more accurate in some ways, mapping the present to imagine the future. Um, because what we are doing is trying to understand how heritage science is being done and what is needed. And um, that we seek to observe and understand the experiences and needs of people in the field globally. Um, one side note, uh, it was mentioned already that the, the need for safe spaces to discuss work in progress uh, is the cause for this entire seminar. And this is one of the reasons we are absolutely delighted to be able to present here, because across the board, every discipline, every related profession around the world, everyone has said this is absolutely key, this is needed. So we're very glad to be here. Okay. Apart from that, though, today I'm not going to discuss so much the results as our approach. Before I get into the, the, the weeds of the approach, I would like to define one key term. Uh, if we could go to the next. Thanks. And so, of course, we could go on for hours defining and redefining all the possible meanings of every term within our title. But I just want to give the definition of heritage science that we are going to use today. And that is as an overarching term uh, encompass encompassing a vast variety of fields. We see it as flexible, diverse, interdisciplinary by default, um, combining the humanities and the sciences, combining the professional and the, the non-professional, every aspects of work and research and care related to heritage. There's plenty of room for different definitions of this term. Uh, this is just the definition we're using today, and I wanted to put that first so that you know what I mean as we go through it. Okay, next slide, please. 
where did we start? Well, the six of us started knowing that we wanted as much as possible to observe what's going on in the field, not to come in with a pre-imposed idea and dump it on top of the field. Uh, we also know and recognize that we are not neutral. Nothing in heritage science or conservation or museums or even the world generally is actually neutral. Um, but it's important, I think, to recognize it so that you can then account for it and adjust for it in your work. So that's where we started. However, we also have considerable experience between the six of us and considerable connections already because we've all been doing research in this field for quite a while. So we started by collecting and discussing our experiences and those of our close colleagues um, in the museum and elsewhere. And some patterns started to emerge. And from these patterns, we drafted these overlapping umbrella topics as we've been calling them. Again, this is a tool for convenience for organizing complex information. It is by no means intended to be a neat and tidy stacking of things in separate boxes. Everything in all of these lists is interconnected. The entire, we could have covered this entire slide with lines connecting everything to everything else because in fact, the entire field is fully interconnected and intersectional. You've muted yourself accidentally, Tamar. Thank you for letting me know. I have no idea how that happened. Can you hear me now? I have no idea at what point it muted though. Well, I, I, I'll take a guess. Um, so yes, this looks very deceptively neat and tidy. In fact, of course, as you will all know, the reality is tangled, disorienting, exciting, sometimes discouraging. And so where do we go from there? Next slide, please. Oh, there, Next slide delay. Uh, so you will see this wonderful illustration that our colleague Maria Laura Petrucelli has put together. And um, you'll see it. Um, complete at the end of the presentation, but it, it expresses very well the dizzying confusion of so many different directions in the positive and the negative and the exciting and the scary. So we had to figure out how to navigate this. The methodology that we've developed, and it took us several months at the beginning of the project, to understand what, what is going on and what is needed, how to shape our project so that it really reflects reality. And um, I would say that the first theoretical underpinning is that of a uh, grounded theory. Oh, sorry. There's one more thing I wanted to say before we got to grounded theory. Because even before the uh, grounded theory, there is one very, very great priority and which I've already touched on, which is that the necessity for the decentralization and diversification of voices across the field. This is needed in many fields in the world beyond heritage science, of course, but it is urgent, especially in heritage science. And as mentioned before, we have a, a certain degree of <laughs> geographical and cultural spread within our group, but that does not reflect the reality. So it is very, very important for us that we take the, the global in our title to mean not the sense of uniformity and of globalization, but the whole world with all its diversity and to, to bring together cultures, regions, large and small institutions, the private as well as the public heritage care is not done only in museums. So obviously the first part of this, therefore the first underpinnings of our theoretical approach is grounded theory. Now, grounded theory is an iterative process of observing what is, observing yourself, observing the outer world, constructing conceptual frameworks to fit what you observe, and then iteratively going through this process again to understand, to readjust the, the concept to fit what, what is going on, what you see, what you observe, rather than, as I said before, what we want to avoid, the walking in and slapping a predetermined hypothesis on top of everything else and that's it. So grounded theory is the first theoretical underpinning, I would say. And um, second to that, um, could we have the next slide, please? I would say that our approach is informed very much by oral history. Uh, because 
essentially what we are doing, and my colleague Glenis will go into the details of this in a moment, um, is speaking to people, having conversations. We speak to people because each person, when attentively heard, can give us a clear view of their particular patch of the world of heritage, heritage science. And as we speak to more people and more people and more people, each of them gives us a clear view in some part of that heritage science island, as our colleague Annalena de Groot calls it. And gradually, we can build up a larger view with great detail in each spot, a larger view of the whole map of the field. And now I'm going to turn you over to Glenis, who has uh, stepped in at the last moment for our colleague Adis, who unfortunately woke up very ill this morning and was unable to speak. Um, so over to you, Glenis, for the nitty gritty of the methodology. <laughs> Thank you. So Tamar has already described um, the very fundamental beginning stages of our process where we were handed this project and figuring out how do we even think about going about this project. And the next stage I would say uh, in developing our methodology was really landing on this tool of semi-structured conversations. And so we use the word conversations rather than interviews because we mean it to be a dialogue. It's fundamentally a co-creation of knowledge. We uh, value the people we speak with as holders of expertise and experience and their perspective. And we also like to have an actual conversation with them where we're asking questions of them, but they are given the opportunity to ask questions of us. And over the course of the first, um, I don't know, say three months of having some conversations, which initially just started out um, for our own kind of research and, and internal purposes, but we started to realize this was a really valuable actual research tool for the work we were doing mapping the current state of the field, uh, we landed on asking three questions that we ask everyone we speak to in one of these research conversations. And the first one is after we introduce ourselves to the person we're speaking with, um, we invite them to introduce themselves to us in their own words. So I think of this as going beyond just what you would see on a CV, but a little bit of life history and the context. And we're specifically also interested in how they first learned about the field of heritage science and how they got into it. Because in the majority of cases, it's not a straightforward path. And this first question is, instrumental and very valuable for two reasons. And the first is it establishes a rapport between us and the person we're speaking with. So this level of comfort, the safe space, exactly as the series is designed to do, that's what we're trying to do, um, build up the trust and, and um, that's so fundamental to collaborations of all kinds. Uh, but as we started having more and more of these conversations, we realized that this initial question gave us a wealth of information as well about the specific times and places that the people we speak to were growing up in, being educated in, and, and the trajectory of their career. So it has also been um, a really great source of a lot of uh, data for us, qualitative data. And then the other two questions we always make sure to ask are kind of two sides of the critical thinking coin. So one is we ask, what are the main existing gaps and challenges that you have seen from your experience and perspective in the field? And to end the conversation on a, a more positive note, we also ask what people are excited about. So this could be a project that they thought went extraordinarily well or has exciting possibilities or a trajectory they see for the future of the field that they think is uh, really going to be beneficial and exciting. And most importantly, uh, as listed at the end here, is that we leave space for a free-flowing conversation. And as I mentioned before, it's really important that we have a dialogue, that we allow ourselves time and space to follow up on comments and ideas that our speakers mention, and to give the floor to the speakers to ask questions of us. And that has been a really productive um, source of uh, data gathering and idea generation for us as well. So how do we find these people we speak to? Uh, we've been using a sampling technique called snowballing. So we start with our connections that we have and we work out from there. And so you can see that is reflected in this map as Tamar pointed out, although we represent uh, both hemispheres and three continents, you can see that there is uh, there are many geographical gaps in the map uh, for where we have spoken to people where they work or um, in the field in these countries. Sorry, my English just dropped out there, but I'm coming back to it. Um, so the yellow countries represent countries where we've spoken to at least one person who's worked in that country. 
more are coming. So if you see us give another talk in even another few weeks, there will be even more countries colored in on this map. And if you are aware of anyone um, who would be good for us to speak to, we invite always, we lo always love talking to people and connecting with new people to learn from new perspectives. Uh, as for uh, the actual methodology, a little bit more nitty gritty, uh, we found that it's super important to record these conversations. And in the kind of blessing in disguise of COVID, uh, we've all gotten very used to doing things over the internet. And in particular, we found Zoom to be very useful. It's low bandwidth, it has decent audio recording quality. Um, we also make sure we document every conversation we have so we can keep track. I think at this point we're up to 34 research conversations, so official ones, in addition to the kind of coffee break chats you might have at a conference or with a colleague um, over lunch. Uh, we take those recordings and we create transcripts. And then because we're aware that we have biases, we also have some tools we use to try and track what we think as an individual looking at the transcript are the main key ideas and themes that come up in a conversation. And then we can compare that to somebody else in our group. And so I'm trained as a scientist, maybe things that are related to the science uh, draw more of my attention than one of my colleagues who is an art historian, for instance. And uh, wrapping up, just a brief reflection on what we've seen. Uh, these are different types of networks uh, that was originally uh, for uh, digital data communication from the RAND from many, many decades ago. Um, but we found that in addition to um, describing our own sort of research progress where we started out centralized, where we were at the core and reaching out, and then we created hubs with people that we spoke to who could help us snowball out. Now we're moving into a phase where we're trying to connect um, the people that we speak to to each other. So going from centralized to decentralized to distributed mode. And that this has also started us to think about the infrastructure in our program title and could one form of this infrastructure be a network? So in addition to the facilities and equipment, the hardware, um, but could we have overlaid with that a distributed network of the software? So the human elements and that human connection. And so with that, uh, we'd just like to acknowledge uh, everyone who is working on this project uh, with from Nikas, our International Advisory Committee, most importantly, everyone who has generously spent time speaking with us so that we can learn from them. And as promised, here is our concluding image to summarize our having fun feeling lost throughout this process. Thank you very much. Super interesting. I cannot wait to see the final results of this. If, if you don't mind, let's uh, continue now with Victor's presentation and we'll take questions together at the end. So the next speaker is Victor Jeffries, conservation scientist at the National Museum of the Royal Navy with a very interesting example of how to use nanoparticles in practice. Go ahead, Victor. Thank you. Can I just check that you can see that? Um, if you, yeah, all good. Okay. And if you can't, or if the slides aren't moving on, please let me know. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about my ongoing research project, which is, as this long title says, looking at whether or not inorganic nanoparticles can be used as antifungal agents, and particularly in the context of treating timbers that are going to be put onto HMS Victory. Um, so probably the initial question to address is what nanoparticles actually are. They sound a lot fancier than they are. They are literally just tiny particles, anything that has a diameter less than 100 nanometers, um, which doesn't make much sense in the context of what you can see, because you can't see that. Um, but compared to things like thickness of standard paper you get in a printer, that's 100,000 nanometers. So you're reducing that by 1,000 times or less. And they have lots of unique properties that differ from kind of the macroscopic counterparts of those same, same chemicals, which mean that they can be used in lots of things that the kind of bigger scale stuff couldn't be used in. So their small size is their selling point, really. Um, it means that they have a high surface area to volume ratio, which basically means that if you think about the surface of a particle is what's interacting with everything around it and what conveys any properties onto other things. And if that's bigger, then 
it's going to have more available to interact with things. And that leads to increased antimicrobial activity, so it's more effective against bacteria and fungi. And in context of things like treating timbers, it's the small size means that it can effectively get into all the small little pores in the wood that larger scale treatments couldn't do. Um, they are highly tunable, so you can synthesize various different nanoparticles in depending on what chemicals you want, what functional groups you might want to add to the surface if you want to change properties slightly, um, and the sizes, and the sizes can change the overall properties of nanoparticles as well. And they a massive selling point is that they are can be synthesized by environmentally friendly methods and they are generally low toxicity and the ones i've been focusing on are specifically low toxicity and they've already already been used in medicine and agriculture and things like that because of this low toxicity and they're also already starting to be researched for conservation science so this is just a random selection of three papers that have looked into this so HMS Victory, most people will have heard of it, but short, it is a kind of launched in the 17, late 1700s and served various different points um, in Royal Navy, most famous for being Nelson's flagship in the Battle of Trafalgar, but it was in use before that and after that. And during its kind of lifetime, both on the sea and then since it's been in dry dock it's um, had to undergo various different points where damage has needs to be repaired or kind of rot which always happens in wood has needed to be taken out and new plants put in all that sort of thing so it's constructed of mostly wood but the age and the species of that wood varies throughout the ship and at the moment it's undergoing well, it's always undergoing conservation work but at the moment it's undergoing a major 10-year conservation project involving removing the outer rotten planks and replacing them with modern oak. So my research is looking into whether or not there are as, whether or not nanoparticles can be used to pre-treat the oak that is going to be going onto the ship to mitigate more fungal damage. So fungi are a problem in basically any wooden structure because it's just a lovely meal for fungus. Um, and in terms of victory, there's lots of sites on the ship where water can get in. Painted timbers mean that the water can't then get out, creating ideal conditions for fungi. And then as fungal decay happens, it creates conditions that allow death watch lethal activity. So none of this is what we want. Um, and here's just some examples of fungi that found on the ship. Um, and they're all in different places, particularly where you get lots of water coming in. So the project is kind of divided into two sections. One is whether or not there is actual antifungal activity of nanoparticles and they can penetrate the wood as you would hope. And then the other one is whether or not nanoparticles can be used in situ on Victory or whether or not they would cause problems for the other materials that need to be on the ship. So focusing first on the first part of the project, um, I initially looked at four different nanoparticles. Now these are chosen based on literature review and their reported properties. Um, so ones that had potential useful activity to prevent fungal, um, fungal infestation of wood um, and also had shown no toxicity to human cells or any animal cells in studies. Um, so that was zinc oxide, magnesium oxide, titanium dioxide, and silicon dioxide, so all metal oxides except for silicon. Um, so the first step was to see whether or not they were antifungal and to do this I employed some classic microbiology and put the nanoparticles either embedded within or on top of um, an agar medium and then added a fungus. So the fungi like to eat the agar and they will grow over it. But if the nanoparticles kill them, then they won't. So it's basically just measure fungal growth across the agar plate. And so when I put the agar, the nanoparticles inside the agar, so the stuff that the fungi are eating actually contains nanoparticles, um, it showed that magnesium oxide was the most antifungal. So these images show the plates after a week of fungal growth. The control on to the side, um, that white area is the fungal mycelium that have grown out from the central plug. Um, and then the ones on the other side show the, that for whether or not nanoparticles there. So you can see the magnesium oxide has basically nothing and that's because it's inhibited growth. Zinc oxide has a little bit um, but not as much as titanium or silicon which didn't show any inhibition at all. 
So then spraying it on the agar is the same sort of thing, measuring um, kind of fungal growth. But in this case, as you go across the plates from the further side of the slide to the middle, the concentration is increasing of the nanoparticle that was added. And the color, if it's kind of closer to white, it means that there is a greater area of fungus. And if it's closer to purple, there's less. So titanium and zinc showed no concentration, no um, inhibition of growth um, compared to the control. And actually titanium seemed to help it. And then magnesium oxide again showed, as you can see, very purple shows a good concentration dependent inhibition on growth and silicon dioxide sort of did but I think that's a direct effect because of um, water which I will go into if anyone wants to know more information on that. Um, so basically based on those tests I could conclude that magnesium oxide was by far the most antifungal and so all my kind of future work was focused on that. Um, so in terms of how to apply it to the wood um, kind of previous work I'd done suggested that spray application was a good way to do it. It's cheap, it's quick, and it can be scaled up to entire timbers. Um, so in, this is basically work, but basically you spray it, leave it overnight and spray it again the next day. Um, and I tested it on these kind of rods that are the dimensions that are shown there. So in terms of looking at how far they got into the wood, I tried several methods. Magnesium is annoying because it's a very light metal and therefore very difficult to detect. So Fourier transform infrared, which basically can detect specific chemicals in a material, um, did show a slight peak, which you can see kind of at one end of like a tiny little dip at one end of those graphs near the um, y axis labels, um, which is the magnesium, but it's kind of convoluted with the wood signals when you look at it in the context of the actual wood. So it's not a very good method to actually detect the magnesium and certainly not to tell how much there's there. Um, so as part of a kind of equipment lending or using scheme, um, I've been able to do some um, CT scans, which basically will let me look at the na nanoparticles in theory within the wood itself. That's quite low resolution, so I can only detect pretty much clusters of nanoparticles or maybe a gradient. Um, but it's, you don't need to destroy the sample and I could do the entire thing. Um, so this was done at the University of Southampton. Um, so this is some of the CT results which show the control versus magnesium oxide. So the control box in orange and the magnesium oxide box in blue. This is just one part of a slice. Um, so there, I don't know if you can see very clearly, but there are like little bright spots in the magnesium oxide sample, which are not in the control sample. And if I count the number of spots going through all the slices of the wood, so basically going through this the whole sample, um, there's a consistently basically none in the control and then there's a fluctuating amount in the um, treated sample. And those are probably, but you can't do elemental detection. So they're probably um, the nanoparticles and they don't show an even distribution through the wood, which is interesting. And they're also not significantly higher at either end, which is also nice. Um, so then a way to look at the actual nanoparticles in more detail and detect the elements is um, electron microscopy. Um, and it's again, it can't resolve individual nanoparticles because they're too small, but it can see clusters and it can detect the elements that are present even if they can't be seen. Um, so here's some results from that. So as you go kind of from one, two, three, that's different sections taken um, through the wood. So one is furthest to the edge, and you can see there are a lot more bright spots and bright areas in that one than in the other ones, and that's all nanoparticles, obviously at a much higher concentration on the surface of the wood. And then all the little areas where it's in the selected area, I've analyzed and they have magnesium in them. But as you go kind of in, you can see that the bright spots are fewer, the magnesium is still there and it's detected also where there aren't bright spots, um, but the concentration is lower. And then when you get right to the center, you can see these bright kind of clusters right in the middle of a vessel, which is quite nice to see. Um, so that kind of supports that the nanoparticles are getting all the way into the wood, which the CT suggested. Um, and then this is just some other images of the different nanoparticles in SEM 
which they just look like little white blobs, but the silicon is quite interesting because it's a bit amorphous and it looks cool. Um, so the other part of the project is whether or not the nanoparticles are actually practical in terms of putting them onto timbers in going onto the ship. So this is ongoing work um, with NC squared at Southampton University who are doing materials testing to make sure that, or doing materials testing generally, and then also um, now verifying that the nanoparticles aren't going to interfere with paint adhesion or it, with use of any kind of corking materials. Um, and I will be doing a scaled up test on a larger piece of wood to see things like how far it can get into a thicker timber and whether or not it takes too long to dry and various things like that, just to make sure that it is actually viable in practice. Um, so I'd say further work includes doing a scaled up test. Um, I will be doing more SEM after exposing treated bits of wood to UV or soaking it to see whether or not nanoparticles leach out or if the UV affects them at all. Um, also seeing whether or not spraying nano, um, spraying magnesium dioxide nanoparticles onto fungal fruiting bodies kills the fruiting body or kills the fruiting body and the mycelia as well. Um, and if anyone has questions about how I'm doing that, I can explain. Um, also some high resolution CT scans on smaller sections to see if I can get more information about where they're sitting inside the wood. And then some comparison against um, standard oracle treatment. And just some acknowledgements of all people I work with in the National Museum of the Royal Navy and various different um, people and universities who are letting me use some of their equipment. So um, the FTI for Mary Rose, NC squared material testing, microviz facilities for CT scanning at Southampton and Crawford University, letting me use their SEM. Great, thank you, <laughs> that is it. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you very much, Victor. Any questions either on, on, on grounded theory or on nanoparticles? Should I just un unmute myself? And yes, yeah. I actually have a question for Victor. Great, go ahead. Uh, well, I have a number of questions. I, I was wondering, I, I didn't catch what the resolution of the CT scan that you managed to do on the sample boards was. And I was wondering if, uh, if your research or if the literature has any suggestions on as to the long-term effect of concentrations of magnesium oxide on the integrity or on the durability of the wood. Per se. So in terms of the first question, it is, I can't remember the exact resolution, but it's on the order of micrometers. Um, so sort of 100 micrometers plus, so it's not going to get anything bigger than, anything smaller than hefty clusters. Um, in terms of the long-term effects of nanoparticles, because it's quite a recent thing to be looked at, there isn't really data on it yet. The best that can be done in terms of trying to look at that is to stress test it. So put it in wood and then basically trying to simulate accelerated aging um, by exposing it to UV or all sorts of challenges and then see how they respond to that. But in terms of the long-term durability, it can only be kind of theorized at the moment. Hmm. I'm a very patient chair, so even though I have questions of my own, I'll shut up to encourage questions. So I don't mind waiting for a while if that pushes someone over the fence. Um, if it's something that requires clarification or you didn't understand any part of the technique, I, there are certainly techniques I haven't understood, and you want clarification, that's also a very worthwhile question. And also feel free to write the questions in the chat. Hello, this is Judy Jacob and the construction site right now, so I don't have my camera on. But I have been doing some work with zinc oxide on stone. And I'm wondering if your magnesium oxide, if you've looked at the, um, the toxicity essentially of bacteria or fungi or both, 
and how it is that it is inhibiting that growth? Um, so I've looked at various different species of fungi um, and seen toxic, uh, it's seen that it's inhibited growth of all of them. Bacteria I've looked at inadvertently by getting contamination on petri dishes. Um, so bacteria are everywhere and they just fall on petri dish. Um, and it showed inhibition there. Um, the th but the theory of how it inhibits their growth is related to the structure of the cell walls of the fungi and bacteria. So it's thought that oxide nanoparticles effectively oxidize and destroy specific bonds in the cell walls of fungi and bacteria. And this is part of the reason why they are more effective on certain types of bacteria that don't have a sort of outer casing around their cell wall. So if the cell wall is not accessible, they're not as effective. Um, whereas bacteria where the cell wall is effective and fungi where the cell wall is always effective, um, accessible, then they are more effective. And this is also thought to be why they aren't effective. They don't kill plant cells, so they can be used in agriculture because the plant cell wall has a very different structure from fungal or bacterial cell walls and human cells have no walls. So um, they're safer. <laughs> I hope that answers the question. Thank you, thank you. It's complicated, I know. But, um, that was a, a good short answer, thanks. I have a, oh, oh. Yes, Caroline? Was that the hand? Yeah, yeah, it was. Sorry, I'm back now. Um, I was so really interested in the uh, grounded research that Tamar and Gladys were talking about, and particularly your, your sort of capturing of all of these free flowing conversations and the organic way that they perhaps develop. Um, are you able to say at this stage a little bit more about the methods that you're using to um, sort of analyze some of that material that comes in? Because, um, of course, one of the challenges is that it's so disparate, potentially. How, how, what's your sort of next phase of work or thinking about how you're going to be going about that part of the research? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'd like to, I suppose, emphasize that we were given originally 12 months for this phase, and it took us probably about six before we really kind of settled into this uh, semi-structured conversation as our methodology. Um, so in an ideal world, we would do the full the transcripts for every conversation, have that kind of um, radar chart where we each kind of evaluate what we think were the key topics that were covered, um, pulling out key words or key phrases, key images, um, uh, descriptors and things like that that were mentioned, and then really do a kind of systematic methodical uh, re reflection and synthesis of all those findings. Um, we're currently hoping to get an extension of another three months, um, which will, will buy us a little bit of time, but uh, the, the real answer is that we're not going to have, I think, the time or resources for the six of us to, to do that full methodical kind of analysis. So we're doing what we can. Uh, we're paying attention to the idea of autoethnography, so trying to pay attention to our own biases, our reactions. Um, we're very aware that what we're doing by its nature is it can't be um, objective. It is what both the material we're gathering and our analysis is very subjective, but we also think that's one of the strengths of, of the approach. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't, I think that's a great question. And if anyone here knows anyone who would have expertise in that kind of thing, we would, we're also looking, we're all basically always looking for ideas and talking to people. So yeah, thank you for that question. And I don't, um, our colleague Mahina Wells is also here and Tamara, so if they want to chime in. I actually just wanted to to uh, mention that our, our colleague Marie Noel is in the the, the the call as well. So please direct uh, any questions to all three of us. Hello, Marie Noel. Um, I'd just like to add that because this is actually one of the in terms of trends and results of things that we have seen is are being brought up consistently globally, um, in many different contexts. Actually, what Glenn has just mentioned of the 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 um, problematic prevalence of short-term projects. Short-term projects are, of course, a very, very important and valuable structure for doing research. But 
when the preponderance of uh, research funding and research uh, support goes to almost exclusively shorter term projects or largely, largely to shorter term projects, or it is very, very difficult to get support for longer term projects. And that has a, a negative impact on the, the uh, safety and stability and, and uh, creativity of the researcher in many senses. And it puts large limits on projects that otherwise could take a much, much larger uh, scope than they, they, are, they are able to, which is one of our findings. I actually haven't, uh, would like to direct one of the questions at Victor, but I see that a question came in from the, the uh, in the chat box and I don't want to, to steal all the question time. So please. Uh, thank you, Daphne. Um, let's go for the question in the chat box. I don't know, Antanas, you were unmuting yourself. Yeah, I was just gonna read it out for everyone. Okay. So that'll be, for Victor, how are you planning on assessing the capacity for killing the different parts of the, of the fungi? If I understood that correctly, are you planning on assessing how the nanoparticles may affect the spores as it tends to be the most resistant structures? Thank you. So um, in terms of the bigger parts of the fungus, the mycelia and the fusion bodies, I'm currently growing a, literally it's a clear plastic bag of straw that I've infected with fungi and the mycelia will grow through the straw. And then after, it's probably got about a week left, um, I open it up, expose it to oxygen, leave it to dry a little bit for a couple of days and it will start to fruit because the fruiting bodies only kind of tend to happen when the fungi are unhappy. And when they're either running out of food or their conditions aren't so great, then they want to get basically dispersed elsewhere. And then once the fruiting bodies appear, I will spray them with um, magnesium oxide and see whether it kills the fruiting bodies, see whether or not there's any effect, effect that I can see on the mycelia that are growing within the straw. And then I can take samples of both fruiting bodies and the mycelia and look at them down a microscope and see if they're kind of showing signs of stress. In terms of the spores, it's more difficult because they're tiny. And, um, but obviously, yes, it's the, would be really useful to be able to kill spores. Um, so, it would be a matter of being able to obtain spores, which can be done, but is a bit tricky. Um, and then figuring out a way to identify whether or not they're dead, because they don't necessarily change obvious morphological structure. It would require um, treating them or not treating them as two controls and then putting them on agar and seeing whether or not they grow. So if I can manage to get hold of spores, it's definitely something that I think would be really nice to look at. Um, but it kind of depends on getting spores. Hope that answers your question. Thanks, Victor. And I believe there is another one for you uh, from Sophie. It says, how are you planning to test whether the nanoparticles are, are practical to use in conservation practice if understood correctly your explanation of the future research? So um, in terms of the specific project that I'm working on in pre-treating timbers that are going on to um, a ship, uh, it's effectively after I've done the test to see how far into wood they can get, um, doing a test on a piece of wood that is basically just a slightly reduced length, um, but the same type of rope, the same general structure of whatever is going to be put on the ship and then treating that and then doing exactly the same as I've been doing before. So chopping it down and analyzing it to see how far nanoparticles got in. Um, I can't obviously, or it would take too long to try and test whether or not they are antifungal in the wood because fungi don't grow quickly and they particularly don't grow in wood, but they grow quickly, but they don't colonize and break down wood quickly. So it would be a several year experiment to actually put them in wood and do it. So all I can do is test whether or not they are antifungal and whether or not they get in the, to the wood. Um, and then because they are unreactive with the wood, then it shouldn't. 
show no signs of changing their structural behavior of the Ashley inside. Um, in terms of any other conservation applications, it would require specific testing designed to suit that particular application to make sure things like it doesn't alter this um, appearance of something. Um, because nanoparticles don't dissolve in water, they can leave a residue, and you need to make sure that you can remove that residue, for instance. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Thanks, Victor. Uh, Tamar, I believe you, you had yourself a question for Victor before, and I didn't let you ask it. Is that right, or maybe misunderstood? No, that, that's quite all right. It's actually, I, I would love to ask you, Victor, if you don't mind, uh, from the perspective of our project, looking, taking one step back sort of to the meta level of your own research, um, working you know, between the lab and a, a, a ship that is you know, still in the water, um, or at least some of the time. Uh, what do you feel to be the challenges, the biggest challenges you face in carrying out your research? Other than that of trying to get spores fast enough to be relevant for the, <laughs> the, the time frame. So I think other than the kind of very specific challenges that are just like technical issues, um, I think the biggest challenge is finding and getting access to the equipment that I need in order to kind of do the tests. So I haven't had any trouble in terms of kind of collaboration with people or anything like that. Um, but the only problem is it requires lots of kind of specific bits of kit and the museum doesn't necessarily have them because it's not designed it's not, you know, it's specific kind of either microbiology kit or kind of structural analysis kit that there's no reason why it would be in a museum institution. Um, so that's definitely the main challenge is just finding where I can get the material or the equipment that is most useful in terms of analysing um, and carrying out the research. I think that's really the real kind of issue, I think. <laughs> Is that, that something that, sense. Thank you. is that something that echoes your own findings, um, Tamar? Um, have you oh, yes. a common response? Yeah. Oh yes, the, the issue of access to equipment and the issues of, uh, in, in every sense, access to equipment, access to institutions, ac access to objects and the challenges when the equipment cannot go to the object or the object cannot go to the equipment. Definitely one of the big themes glo globally, so to speak. So that, it relates uh, to another question I wanted to ask you. Uh, if whether you, you have divided your participants in groups and whether the answers vary between these groups in any way or if they cluster in categories, because I imagine someone in Victor's position being embedded in a museum would have more problems of access to equipment, someone in a university will have more problems of access to objects. Uh, do you have these sections and do you see differences like that? Yes, uh, is the short answer. <laughs> um, so what you just outlined is definitely something that we've heard, um, but especially with our, our global focus, it's also really um, been eye-opening to me. I, I'm uh, from the U.S. that what are the challenges experienced by um, conservators or heritage scientists in parts of the world that are, say, in the subtropical climate and just the sheer challenges of the climates they deal with if they have, um, like, uh, oil paintings um, and and I recently was listening to someone from Indonesia who was talking about the sort of catch-22 of where do you have these um, painting storage when one side of the island is prone to floods, but the other side is where the volcano is. So there's earthquakes and mudslides, and then what if the volcano explodes, which is a whole different set of challenges than I had encountered before. Um, and another conservator in um, the Caribbean was talking about how there are only four conservators in her country, the entire country, and uh, she doesn't have a fume extractor hood. She doesn't have a table. She's having to do treatments on the floor. So there are some similarities that we, that's our umbrella topic of access, but some of the nuances and particularities, there are some groupings, say, by that. I just mentioned geographies, but there are challenges that someone who is a freelance conservator won't encounter that 
um, somebody at a large museum who's a conservator will encounter and, and vice versa. So there's lots of ways to kind of slice it up and, and draw similarities and, and differences. Thanks. And before we have, uh, we go to the last presentation, there are two minutes for another question. I have one if there's no one, but I want to give a last opportunity for one question. I've got two, actually one for each presenter, but... <laughs> You'll have to choose sometimes. Yep. Um, go ahead, go ahead. I suppose uh, for... Well, I can mention them both. Um, Maybe some one of them will just be a chance to think. So for uh, for Victor, they'll probably be. I think you mentioned that the nanoparticles are not soluble in water. Is that correct? Do you think it's a it's a drawback or or, a, or an advantage in terms of uh, marine timber conservation? Because on one hand, it it the reversibility then uh, probably suffers because if anything, the nanoparticles will stay embedded in the wood, but on the other hand, they will not get removed uh, in such a humid environment or when the wood is submerged, for instance. Not not, in your, not just in the case of HMS Victory, but insane. Uh, yeah, so I think I find, I mean, I've been kind of debating this too, um, and did look into some ways to better solubilize them, but I think it is an advantage to have them insoluble in water. So you can disperse them in the water and the water will act as a carrier. Um, so it will carry them into vessels in wood, for instance, um, but it won't carry them away again. So they will, basically they don't dissolve in water because they don't interact very strongly with water molecules but they have a slight charge on them, which means that they will interact more strongly with cellulose um, fibers, for instance, in the wood. So they will be carried in the water, but they will bond more strongly to the wood. And so they will get left there. And then obviously if loads of water then comes in, they might get washed away because the bonds are being outcompeted. And so it will go back to the water. But I think the fact that it is insoluble in water is an advantage for this application, but maybe not necessarily for other um, possible applications. Okay, thank you. 